out there and look at contemporary photography, a lot of photographers have been very focused on this whole idea of um, kind of like man's effect or human's effect on our world. So we're going to be spending a lot of time on that today. So just as a reminder, we're here in July 20th, and I hope you come back next week, next Monday, we'll talk about something very different, these artists that construct illusions. This is the quick reminder. You know, we talked about the fact that in general, contemporary photography is considered to be photography from around the early 80s through to, till today. And some of the salient points about that is that you're talking about color very often, not always. We'll actually see some artists today that are still using black and white. Very large prints, if you recall, larger than ever. A lot of digital photography and the manipulation that comes with that. And then this idea that photographers are not just photographers, they're contemporary artists and their pricing goes way up sometimes at auction and the fairs. We talked a little bit about the fact that on the left side of the spectrum, last week and this week, we talked about artists that are going out and documenting what's out there in, in a way that suggests that what you're seeing is the truth and nothing but the truth. You know, they're just kind of out there documenting. Next week is when I tell you, we'll look at a few artists or several artists that are really almost creating these illusions. Some of them are sculptors, set designers, makeup artists, and all sorts of things. When you look at their photograph, you're, you're not even clear that that's all the stuff they did behind the scenes. They used crews and actors and makeup artists, and they bring these illusions to us. So this is the really quick reminder that last, last week we talked a little bit about all these photographers that came out of the Dusseldorf Academy under the tutelage of Hilla and Bernd Bescher. They were the couple that went around for decades and documented in a very meticulous, objective way, all these industrial structures that they went and saw in Germany, in the UK, in the US. And they were all about repetition and being very objective and taking photographs that would just capture the objective reality of these structures, you know, form and design and structure. We talked about the fact that they used the same vantage point, they would photograph at the same time of the day, spring and fall, so that you were always just seeing a documentation of these structures. And they created these typologies where you could actually kind of compare all these structures in one kind of series of of images. And then we talked a little bit about Thomas Roof, who in a way was doing something similar, but now with portraiture, and again, capturing his colleagues in this very kind of unemotional, very objective way, just looking at, you know, what does someone's surface reveal about them? Actually, not that much. <laughs> what you're looking at is surface. And we did talk about the breakthrough in printing with some of these larger than ever photographs and prints than ever before. So that'll be a theme today as well. And then uh, some of you loved this, learning about Canada Hoffer and these kind of incredibly rich visual interior spaces, whether it's libraries or theaters and how she was also going and documenting these in a very kind of objective manner. And finally, and this is a good transition slide because we're gonna be talking about the landscape. We talked about Italian photographer Massimo Vitali, and even though he's not from the Bescher School, you know, he has spent decades documenting <clears throat> these beautiful landscapes, not only in his home Italy, but elsewhere and looking at how these people relate to their landscape. Very often they're at leisure, but you start seeing some overcrowding. And in a way, this is a good, again, a good lead in into our lecture today, because it's about 
how humans occupy this earth. So here we are, the human altered landscape. And <clears throat> I thought it would be fun to take you back to some of the earliest landscape photography, because if we're gonna talk about the human altered landscape, we might as well go back to some of the earliest Carlton Watkins, I don't know how many of you know this gentleman. Imagine how early this is. It's the mid 19th century. You're talking about the earliest guy that went out west with all the equipment that you needed back then. Because you know, these were not at all portable small cameras. You needed a tent. He was apparently using a donkey to transport it all. Photography back then used large glass plates that needed to be wet with collodion. So there was a whole process to going out west and capturing these images. But these are some of the earliest images that you know folks in the East Coast ever saw of a place like Yosemite. And I have to tell you, this kind of work was instrumental in Lincoln signing uh, a law that would make places like Yosemite a national park. So that's how incredible this is. Um, by the way, what I want you to notice though is that this is about showing you the landscape in this kind of most pristine way. It looks like a human has never been there. There's no garbage, there's no tourism. And of course, that was the idea is let's show you kind of the, the beautiful land that God has given us, manifest destiny. We're going west. By the way, what's funny about Carlton Watkins is he initially went west to find gold. <laughs> so <laughs> what wind up being gold is his photographs, but he never did find the actual mineral. And I love this because you know, now we, we get thrilled by our iPhone 11 and our Instagram. Back then, the images of a Watkins would be viewed in what was called a stereoscope. Some of you are old enough to remember the little plastic things we would have where you would look at pictures one after another. If you put two images by Watkins into this machine, you're basically just having your left eye look at one image and the right eye look at the other. And that created this, this kind of situation of depth. You were looking not only at Yosemite Valley, but you were looking at it like in 3D. So I think that's kind of fun. It also reminds us that the images weren't that large. You know, they were reasonably small. Now we have to mention probably the most important landscape artist of all. And having worked at the Christie's Photographs Department, I can tell you that at every auction, what sells the most to this day is Ansel Adams. I don't think I saw any Ansel Adams that didn't get grabbed at some price. People love this. The thing about Ansel Adams is, once again, we're seeing this incredibly pristine Yosemite, no humans there, no, no, no real effect of, of humans there yet. As you may know, Ansel Adams is known for being part of a group of California-based or Western photographers that really believed in pure photography, an incredibly sharp focus. They were actually, some of them became part of what's called the group F64. That's a reference to the smallest aperture that those cameras had. And these artists like Ansel Adams wanted to capture every imaginable detail of a landscape. This was about incredibly crisp photography. I think people go to Yosemite and think, why doesn't my picture look like <laughs> the Ansel Adams if I stand in the same place? One of the things about Ansel Adams is he became an expert at the whole issue of printing and tonality. So he was a believer that, you know, the negative is just the beginning. He manipulated his prints in such a way that the contrasts were perfect and the tonalities were so crisp. 
I even included a famous quote from Ansel Adams here that he viewed the negative as comparable to a composer's score and the print kind of the performance. So there's tons of Ansel Adams prints out there <clears throat> and he believed that every print counts because every print could almost be a little bit different in the way he actually um, manipulated and made it what it is. So this kicks off actually our talk for today because that was a little bit of a journey. What you saw is a few of the people that had taken these pristine, perfect, beautiful images of the West. And now I'm taking you to what's considered today kind of a watershed exhibition at the Eastman Kodak House up in Rochester. I don't know how many of you have been up there, but obviously being kind of the home of Kodak, there's a very important <clears throat> photography, photography center there that has ongoing exhibitions. And I'm gonna take you back to the fall of 75. We were probably wearing bell bottoms and maybe had long sideburns. I don't know, there disco music playing on the radio. And here was this exhibition called New Topographics. And it was called Photographs of a Man Altered Landscape. And so I want to show you, actually, if you, this is literally a, I, what I pulled is the map of the exhibition. Like these were the people that were being shown. And you'll notice at the top that the Beshers were actually included. So they were, you know, with their industrial structures and so on, considered part of this movement of documenting the landscape with human effects on it. But let me show you a couple of the artists that were there as well. One of them is Robert Adams. And by the way, some of you may wonder, oh, is that Ansel Adams' son or brother? <laughs> Absolutely no relationship. It is funny that they're both Adams. This is the kind of stuff they were showing. Um, look at how different this is from the Carlton Watkins or the Robert Adams, I mean, the Ansel Adams. You still have kind of this beauty of the landscape in the background. He's from Colorado. So he was focusing not only on Colorado, but some points west of there. You still have this gorgeous mountain and cloudy landscape. But what he's talking about is the expanding suburbs to the West, or what he almost considered like the heatless development of our landscape. It's almost this idea that, you know, we have a changing landscape. It's no longer the landscape of Ansel Adams. And what's funny about this is that part of it looks really banal and like, oh my God, why are we looking at mobile homes? That's horrible. But that was exactly the point. It was almost contrasting the beautiful nature behind it with these boxy, artificial, <laughs> man-made constructions that are now home to a lot of people. It was basically all about the changing landscape of the US. Um, some of the images look like these. You know, they look basically like endless suburbs that have come into fruition in the West. Um, someone said, it's, the beauty is not entirely eclipsed. You've got the mountains in the backdrop, but you also now have this very clear evidence of like humans exploiting and maybe degrading nature to some extent. One of the series I thought would be interesting to show is this 27 roads. You know, back in the 60s and the 70s, there was a great deal of conceptual art where folks would go around and let's say maybe take lots of photos of gasoline stations in, in the, like Ed Roche did. And Robert Adams did this exploration of roads in the West and he photographed them and created this book called 27 Roads. And 
what's funny about it is that it does have this repetitive C reality, like the Besher school that we had looked at. And in a way, roads are the ultimate evidence that, you know, man now needs to go through and get places through this landscape. So it's a very um, unique project that again shows the changing landscape. I just wanted to show you one other artist from that show. Um, Stephen Shore is one of the first artists that actually had color photographs exhibited in museums. Um, along with someone like William Eggleston, who's the other, you know, you're talking about the fact that color photography back in the 50s, 60s, even early 70s, was the kind of photography that you and I would take of our dog and our friend and our neighbor and the birthday. Museums and the art world didn't believe in color photography. Most of the art photography had been, you know, um, Arbus, Winog Winogrand, Friedlander, everything that mattered was black and white. Walker Evans, Dorothea Lang. Stephen Shore, at the age of 16, actually sent a couple of photographs, which I think is amazing, to the curator of photography at MoMA. And they actually bought a few of his photographs at the age of 16, which is a pretty remarkable anecdote. Talk about being entrepreneurial. What I want you to see here is that he's also looking at this idea of the landscape of the West, but now you've got this funny, you know, <laughs> this lonely phone booth standing there. But the thing about Stephen Shore is that they're very well thought out. If you think about the composition, it's very carefully, carefully constructed. And you've got these interesting wires kind of diagonally over here. And the whole idea with Stephen Shore is that he was making people look at stuff that's right in front of us, but we almost never take the time to look at. By the way, there was a recent retrospective of his work and it's decades and decades and decades of work. Um, I mean, look at this. Again, sometimes nowadays you would look at this and go, what in the world? This is just a photograph of a gas station. But in a way, it's because no one had ever done this. No one had been looking at, let me take a beautiful, crisp photograph of the corner of Beverly and La Brea, which by the way, this makes me laugh because I lived right nearby there for a couple of years. There's almost no trees to be seen. There's a gas station there. It's kind of the ultimate Let's look at the beauty or maybe not so beauty of a gas station in the middle of LA. Um, when you look at these in person, in a way they are beautiful because even though you're looking at the gas station, there's wonderful color and crispness and detail. And there's some others that are more creative. Like I loved this one, which is obviously the back wall of a drive-in theater. So again, it's almost like this wall's just constructed right there in the middle of nowhere because obviously humans created a drive-in theater and there it is kind of, it needs a little bit of a coat of paint. And this one I, I chose as well. He went all the way to Oregon and other places. It's, it's, it's kind of a funny, ironic photograph because you've got this pristine landscape with snowy mountains, and it happens to be a billboard in another landscape. So there's something really fun about kind of the, the landscape in the landscape. So now, believe it or not, we're jumping some decades because the reason I wanted to show you those artists was just to basically say that was the moment when artists started looking at this idea of the changing landscape. And now we're gonna look at some contemporary artists that have been documenting the human landscape 
in very, very large prints like the ones we talked about last week. This is actually a German artist by the, by the name of Jeff Wall, who wound up, Michael, sorry, I'm sorry, Michael Wolf, sorry. Jeff Wall is next lecture. Michael Wolf was actually um, a photojournalist for the magazine Stern in uh, Germany, but he also spent a lot of time in Asia, specifically in Hong Kong. This gentleman sadly died only about a year ago. I wanted to show you his work because what he became enthralled by is this idea of what he calls architecture of density. And Hong Kong is one of the most densely populated places on this earth, which means it has these enormous, enormous buildings that look like this. And when you use a large format camera and a large printer and you use color and you make sure everything is crisp, they become really wild. There's almost this sense of claustrophobia, of repetition. There's something nearly abstract about this. I wanted to show you um, this. I mean, they're really breathtaking because there's a wild part of this is that you don't see any humans <laughs> except we know there's like thousands of humans living in these buildings. And of course he, take, he took them in these incredibly large formats. So when you go to the gallery, what you see is these incredibly abstract prints. I mean, actually, if you and I were standing in front of this, you're not even sure what you're looking at. So it's almost um, this kind of strange idea that even where all these people are living, we can take an image that becomes completely almost humanless or abstract. And there's this one as well. And again, what makes these very beautiful is that the, the amount of detail and the scale and the color and the detail is, is really incredible to look at. I thought I would take you now back to the west of the US. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Salton Sea. Uh, I became uh, quite, uh, I don't know, not obsessed, but quite interested in this. I did live in LA and in San Diego, and I have to say that when I lived out there, I never heard of the Salton Sea. Um, the Salton Sea is, believe it or not, the largest uh, body of water in all of California. And if you look here, there's LA, if you drive east towards Riverside and onto Palm Springs and Palm Desert, you find the Salton Sea. And what happened is that in the early part of the 20th century, they wanted to get more water into what's called the Imperial Valley. And they managed to reroute water from the Colorado River over to the Imperial Valley. But at some point there was something almost like an accident where the water overflowed and it spilled into this place and it created, you know, normally we would think of it as a lake. The reason it's called the sea is because the saline, the salinity is so high that it's much higher than the salinity of like the Pacific Ocean. By the way, it's not as high as the Salt Lake in Utah, but I digress. I wanted to show you that this was a place that in the 50s and 60s, there's Frank Sinatra and Jerry Lewis and postcards and people boating and skiing. And it was considered the glamour capital. <laughs> Do you know that they actually, I read that more people used to go to the salt and sea than Yosemite. So it was actually this kind of like hot and happening place. If you're going to Palm Desert and Palm Springs, you might as well go to this beautiful lake. 
Well, that all changed, I'm sorry to say. The water kept drying up, going in, drying up, going in. It's very complicated. But what wound up happening is the salinity became so high that most of the fish you could even find there died. And not only that, <laughs> the worst thing is that it started to stink terribly. I mean, it was apparently just like, you do not want to be near this lake or sea. And so th that was a long introduction to tell you that Robert, I mean, Richard Misrock is an artist that became very interested in the Salton Sea. When you look at these prints, you have to say that it, it's incredible because even though you're looking at this abandoned sea that no, no one lives around there anymore, well, a few people, but it's kind of this abandoned ecological catastrophe. And Richard Misrock has taken these photos, and by the way, in the bottom right there, those are all dead fish. And apparently like thousands of dead fish wash up in the, in, in the kind of its coasts. But I want you to look at the, the beauty of the images because even though you're looking at kind of this, this kind of, um, I don't know, this very sad abandoned place, the, <clears throat> the images are beautiful because the way the, the sky and the sea almost reflect each other beautifully. Um, he's taken photos of these like submerged trailer homes that were just abandoned there by people. <clears throat> and this one's my favorite, I have to say. <clears throat> I actually saw this image at auction at Christie's a couple of years ago and I, I really wanted this, but I have to tell you it was about $25,000. So I was like, I don't like it quite that much. <laughs> but it's a diving board. And the thing about it is that there's something very metaphorical about this, right? It's almost like the diving board into nothingness. There's this swimming pool that clearly used to be probably a fun happening place right by the Salton Sea. And now it's just empty. And, but I mean, look at the colors. It's almost like this pastels with the sky and the sea almost melding together and it's just something really a little bit disquieting, but very beautiful about it. By the way, if you're interested in the Salton Sea, <laughs> there's this free little video on YouTube called The Useless Sea. And you know what, it's only about seven minutes long. And I have to say that the, the images and the photography are absolutely stunning. Uh, and it just, it kind of reminds you that even a place like that still has a great deal of beauty. There's birds flying, they rely on tilapia. It's the only fish that can still live in the salty sea. <laughs> so the next time you're having tilapia, remember it's <laughs> one of the only fish that can thrive in such. The other documentary, I don't know if you're a fan of, John Waters, but he actually narrates. It's called Plagues and Pleasures on the Salton Sea. And there are still these residents that live around there that are, you know, leave it to him. He found these really quirky people that are revolutionaries and nudists and whatnot. And they still believe the sea is coming back and whatnot. It's kind of funny. And just to just to show you a few more images by Richard Misra. I, this is, I feel ignorant. This is another thing I didn't know. There's this place in, <clears throat> there's this place in Louisiana that's uh, nicknamed Cancer Alley. I don't know if you knew that, but it's the 85 miles from Baton Rouge to New Orleans. And it, it's basically a, a huge location of petroleum companies and Dow Chemical and others. And 
Well, it wound up being a place where people are, I think about, I think maybe 50 or 100 times more likely to get cancer if you live there. These images are really troubling, but again, there is this strange beauty about them, right? It's something like you're looking at a hazardous waste containment area, but there's these kind of ghastly trees and shadows reflecting on the water and this closed gate. And again, he's creating, I guess, what could be almost considered beautiful images of very sad places. And the last thing I'll show you about Misrach, you know, there's so much talk about the wall and the border and whatnot, but we rarely actually see <laughs> the border between the U.S. and Mexico. And he actually has spent some time down there, and I think he wanted to almost look at, you know, what does this border actually look like? And I guess an image like this is interesting because it shows you how you know, you have this beautiful landscape and then you've got this basically this very arbitrary man-made fence that runs along it. And I mean, obviously borders are important, but it, it just kind of reminds you that there are these huge changes to the landscape we make. And this one I think is really strange and kind of funny because it's basically a, a beach in Tijuana and it's almost a dividing two countries with this curtain and you can kind of still see the, the nice umbrellas and the fun on the other side, but not quite because you've got this kind of like iron curtain, so to speak. So now we're still in the west of the US briefly. I'll keep moving along. I think I might have teased you last week with this and asked you, you know, do you know where this might be? And I said, it's not the moon. And I don't know if you gave it some thought. Well, this, my friends, is actually just 65 miles from Las Vegas. It's a place where Emmett Gowan went called the Nevada Test Site. And I, I, I included this little map so you can see where we're talking about. So this gentleman I only discovered not that long ago at Pace Gallery. They were showing photographs of this project. You know, it took him over 10 years to negotiate with the Department of Energy to get access to this area. This area, um, was active from 51 to 91. So figure throughout the entire Cold War. And it's the most nuked <laughs> place in the world. You know, the US felt if we're gonna do atomic bomb testing, we might as well do it kind of in the middle of nowhere. And what you're looking at there are not craters, you know, made by volcanoes, they're actually craters made out of atomic bomb testing. Um, this is 60 miles northwest of Vegas. The, the whole area is, it's huge. It's 1,360 square miles. So it's not a small place. And they basically, several thousand atomic bombs were tested here. By the way, what is amazing is that when you look at a crater like that, it's because the test was done underground and then almost like a sinkhole is created. So the sand almost like sinks into the earth. What's amazing is that when you look at a crater like that, I mean, your initial reaction is, oh, it must be something done by nature, you know, some volcanic thing. And it's, it's really disconcerting. Um, by the way, this artist was told, you know, isn't this horrible? You're like profiting or making photographs of something so horrible. And I think he, he said, well, you know, there's something redemptive or almost beautiful about this. If nothing else came out of it, we actually have these beautiful images. 
By the way, at Pace Gallery, when I went and saw these images, they actually have the, longi the latitude and longitude of each of these craters. So they're all very well classified and identified. And I mean, they do make for these incredibly kind of otherworldly images that are clearly taken from aerial views. I am sad to say that westerly winds for years made thousands of people get leukemia, lymphoma, breast cancer, and whatnot, because this is really not that far from some places where residents live. I thought you would be either horrified or, or have a laugh at this. Once upon a time in the 1950s, Las Vegas actually promoted come to Vegas where you can see real life mushroom clouds of atomic tests happening nearby. So I, I couldn't believe this when I saw it. This is actually the Las Vegas Strip with a mushroom cloud behind it. And here you've got these nice people at a pool and you also see the testing going on over there. <clears throat> Let's move quickly to Roberto Polidori. This is a contemporary artist. You'll often see his work again at auctions and art fairs. So speaking of nuclear energy, guess where he decided to go? He decided to visit what was called zones of exclusion. Some of the towns near Chernobyl, he went there 15 years after the reactors melted down. Some of you may remember that was in 86. So he went in 2001 and he really wanted a document, you know, what, what do these abandoned villages and towns look like? So here's an example of a really large print that shows this abandoned building in Chernobyl. Polidori is known for, in particular, his interior photography. So of course, these are very disturbing. Uh, these are images of some of what he found inside these buildings. This is a nursery um, in, a in a kindergarten in this Chernobyl area. One of the things that's worth noting very often in these images, it's almost as if nature outside is still growing and well. There's almost this weird contrast between kind of these objects that are destroyed and left behind and the plants outside saying, well, we're still fine and we'll, we're still growing. Uh, same here, this is a maternity ward in Chernobyl with these really creepy, um, you know, abandoned uh, cribs and again, the plants outside thriving. And then the actual control room of reactor number four, which was the reactor that actually led to this disaster. Over 100,000 people uh, were evacuated in 86. Oops. But I wanted to show you what the other place he went to, if you're seeing a theme with Polidori, not all, not all of it, but in some cases, he really is after documenting human disasters. And he went to New Orleans the minute Hurricane Katrina hit. And he went all around New Orleans. And by the way, he uses an enormous camera and equipment. So these prints are very large. And he wanted to go there when no one was even visiting yet and document some of the destruction You might think, you know, what's, what's so nice about this? What is this about? Um, in some ways, he believes that these are almost like mementos for those could not, that could not return. Keep in mind, these are homes of people that left and never even went back. 
you could almost compare them when we study Greek and Roman ruins. These are almost like contemporary ruins of a city, you know, ravaged by Katrina. Um, it was so recent when he went there that he was going into houses that had just barely been explored or inspected. He explains that this type of graffiti on the houses was the type of coding that they were using to explain, you know, we've already visited here. There were either no one living there or they had left or whatnot. And again, this mimics a little bit what he saw in Chernobyl. And, and I think people describe it as almost like haunting documents or paradox, paradoxically beautiful wreckage. Because if you look at the images, the color, the color of that wall is still beautiful. You see this kind of the remains of a family that lived there, the chandelier and the paintings, but of course destroyed. Someone here said, mapping the lives of the absent. So there's something here quite profound and kind of haunting. So very quickly, let's move to a really huge artist that for decades has been documenting the changing landscape. Edward Bertinsky is a Canadian artist from Ontario. And what's kind of ironic is that Talk about a place that's, that has beautiful landscape, Canada. I mean, he, he could have spent years just going around and taking Ansel Adams type photographs of, of the forests and the waterfalls. He instead has published this book that captures a lot of his work for years called The Anthropocene. This is gonna be maybe a new term for some of you. It's a term you can now learn and throw out at a party. When we're back at parties. <laughs> Anthropocene, you know how when we study archaeology and geology, there's all these geological epochs or ages. This one's been proposed as of late. It's the idea of the, the, the age in which humanity has begun to have significant impact on the environment. And by the way, some believe it started since the Industrial Revolution. Others think it's been more maybe since, let's say, the 1960s. But it's this idea of, you know, man now having significant impact on our environment. Let me show you some images by Bertinsky. There are so many, but this just gives you an idea. The first that I'll show you are all about what you might call extraction. So how humans extract from Earth? Well, one way we do that is mining, of course. And so here's this, mind you, these are huge, again, large format prints. They're really gorgeous to look at in terms of the color and the detail. What you're looking at is a, a, you know, a copper mine in Utah. Someone actually commented at a lecture that it almost looks like a Greek amphitheater, right? With all those levels. Another way that we extract from Earth is of course oil fields. And here's these, this kind of diptych of these fields in Azerbaijan. I had never seen this. These are salt, salt pans. I was in Peru a few years ago and part of the tour involved going to these salt pans. And, you know, you see these really huge areas of earth that are completely white. And they're basically, you know, that's where a lot of, of our salt comes from. And then, sadly, this is a lot of deforesting and logging going on in the Vancouver area. So as you can see, a lot of his work's been about almost extracting from earth. What's interesting is he's done a whole series of what he calls manufactured landscapes. These take you to places that are just like enormous factories. In this case, for instance, a chicken processing plant in China. And they're remarkable just because the scale and the color 
And there's something almost surreal about seeing that many people working with chicken in one place. So there's the extraction, there's the manufacturing, and then of course there's the, where does it all go? So there's a lot of photography, there's about, you know, the landfills and the waste. So again, the effect of humans spans all the way from extracting to manufacturing to creating waste. In many ways, Bertinsky is taking us to places that we've just never seen. And sadly, you know, when we take our recycling out and throw our couple of bottles in the bin, we don't quite have this in our minds. And by the way, this artist has said that none of his work is meant to be either political or um, kind of a complaint about corporations or anything like that. He's just going and documenting. This one's pretty amazing. Um, it's like this huge, huge pile of rubber tires. And it's just one more example of the kind of stuff he does. It's visually stunning. Because, you know, how often do we see that many tires in one place? It's also, of course, kind of sad. And in the last few minutes, I'll just, I wanted to show you the work of a Brazilian artist. His name is Sebastião Salgado. And he's actually working with black and white photography, which is interesting because you know, he could choose color. Here's this place that when you first see it, you're like, what in the world is that? It just looks like something out of a movie. Well, it turns out that in the 80s in Brazil, there was a gold mine called Serra Pelada. And basically it just became like the place to basically have hundreds of thousands of people go and manually take gold out. And they look like little ants. It's just absolutely breathtaking and horrific because I'm sure the conditions were not very nice. And the closer you get to it, you realize that all these little ants are actually men basically extracting ore and transporting it. And uh, there's just something really unbelievable about seeing that. By the way, um, as he gets closer, um, when you look at his work, you know, up to now today, we barely saw humans. We saw a lot of the places where humans live or humans extract. We haven't really seen humans. In his work, you see a lot more humans in that environment. I find this image fascinating because this young man is standing against this wooden pole and there's, these people are wearing, I mean, they're not veils, but they're obviously protection for their heads. And it almost, to me, I don't know about you, it gives almost something biblical. There's almost like, um, Calvary or <laughs> it looks like something out of um, biblical stories. These exhausted men, completely dirty. By the way, this mine was shut down. It's now covered in water from what I understand, but it gives you an idea of his work. The other thing that Salgado has looked at a lot is the enormous displacement of people. So in a scene like this, these are Rwandan refugees, and you just kind of see the scale of, again, all these people that look like little tiny ants with, you know, the, the tents or their, 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 where they're living displaced. But again, he sometimes take, goes in and shows you, in a way, the humans involved. And this looks almost like a scene from one of those disaster movies from the 70s, and sadly it's not. And you see this woman holding her baby just surrounded by this kind of human catastrophe, so to speak. So I thought I would close with something slightly, I'm not gonna say happier, but at least um, not refugee camps. 
Uh, we've been stuck in our homes for months with COVID. And this, this artist out of the Bay Area, I don't know if you know him, his not, name is Todd Heido. One of his most famous series is called Homes at Night. And guess what? One of his influences, remember when we were looking at Robert Adams in the 70s with those little suburban houses out in California? Well, he, he's, it's not surprising he says Robert Adams is one of my influences. Because at the end of the day, you can say, well, what is so interesting about this? These are just little suburban houses. But I think what he does is by by capturing them without any humans in the pictures, just the lights on in the homes, and this very atmospheric, you know, the sky colors are beautiful and the shadows. It creates this very um, beautiful kind of ethereal, transcendental, maybe psychologically <laughs> laden image. Um, some people say that when they look at these, it reminds them of like the home where they grew up or it makes them think of, you know, wow, who lives there? I wonder what's going on inside. And this is the last two that I'll show you. By the way, he actually has said that one of his other influences has been Hitchcock. So he acknowledges that there's something kind of eerie or scary about these. Um, because let's face it, this color of the sky that looks almost in flames. And this one on the right, to me anyway, I don't know if you're a fan of The Shining, but it gives you that creepy, creepy feeling of like nighttime in the snow. And again, um, this is Homes at Night by Todd Heido. And I thought, since we've been indoors so much during COVID, we can relate to the idea of having our little light on in our homes. <laughs> so I wanted to close, just remember next week, Constructed Truths and Illusions. To give you an idea, this is the most expensive photograph ever sold at auction by Andreas Gursky. It went for 4.3 million. Come next week and we'll talk about why. Because even though you're seeing that, it was originally that. So he really manipulates images and plays with, with us. And that's why I thought we would start with Gursky because he's, he's from the Bescher School. He started with those really documentary professors, but he starts playing around with images. And we'll also look at images like these, Thomas D. Mand, makes you think you're looking at the Oval Office. But guess what? What you're looking at is a life-size set that he and a staff of about 14 created during two weeks. Uh, this was commissioned by the New York Times Magazine when Obama was elected. And what you're looking at is not the Oval Office, it's actually a, a, a cardboard set and then he takes an image of it and then he, he destroys the set. So we'll look at stuff like that. And then finally, we'll look at other artists like Gregory Crutzen, who creates these incredibly eerie, amazing images. Um, some of them look a little bit almost like out of close encounters of the third kind, stranger things, that kind of eerie suburban thing. It's completely made up. These are actors, these are sets. This is all artificial lighting. He uses crews the size that movie directors use just to create these. So now you know what I mean by constructed truths and illusions for next week. And with that, I will stop sharing so we can have a little conversation here. Ephraim, that was amazing. That was fantastic. Oh, good, good. I'm, I'm glad you left the marketing world and moved over to what you do. <laughs> amazing. Oh, that's great. So um, there's a few questions in the chat. I'll let you take them. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I see here a comment that the Mizrach images are like